Welcome to this new episode of The Context. I want to talk to you about languages and cultures. In the field of computer programming, we are accustomed to the blossoming of new languages and the fact that those that want to actively provide the instructions of uh, what computers, mobile phones, cloud computing services, artificial intelligence systems have to do, they always have to learn new tools, new systems, but even new languages. Lisp, Prolog, Fortran were in the first generation of powerful languages together with COBOL that uh, for a certain period of time was the leading programming language that everybody used to make sure that uh, the accounting systems and the payroll systems in mainframe computers would work. And then others came around, BASIC, PASCAL, Turbo Pascal, and some of you may remember these names. Visual Basic um, was the leader for introducing millions of people to developing and designing applications on the graphical user interfaces that were at the time very popular but uh, also very new. Smalltalk, Objective C, C++, C Sharp were the generation of programming languages that introduced object-oriented programming, a new paradigm that promised what um, and how programmers, developers could do in order to improve their productivity, the re reusability of their code, uh, and the dependability, the trustworthiness of the applications, how bug-free they could be. Of course, as computers become more powerful, the systems that uh, we use in order to uh, try to program them must evolve as well. And uh, these systems can take advantage of uh, various ways uh, through which the, the, the computer helps the programmer in turn. As an example, the first computers were programmed in not even a programming language. They were programmed manually changing the hardware so that it would execute a given computation and then when you needed a different computation you would change the hardware, you would change the um, physical layout of the computer. Then with microprocessors it became possible to actually feed what we call today appropriately programs to a given hardware that didn't need to be changed every time, it was universal in this sense. But still the programming language was extremely close to the hardware itself. It was called assembly language programming and the translation into the code executed on the hardware was immediate. Newer languages introduced higher abstraction layers. For example, when today uh, you specify for a window to be drawn on the computer screen uh, or a dialogue to be shown on the phone of a user, the instruction that you give to the computer is very compact. The position of the window, its dimensions, the text to be displayed on the dialog and what kind of input field it requires and uh, how you decide to finish the input sequence and communicate the value of the input field to the phone. But this simplicity hides a cascade of effects that the layer of abstraction that we achieved 
is uh, able to, to, to hide to the programmer and the cascade calling the windowing system, calling the um, input and output streams on the device, calling the storage mechanisms, all of this is triggering, evoking. This abstraction is extremely useful and, and necessary. Today's computer programs can be very complex. It was believed that beyond a certain threshold, computer programs would become too complex and unmanageable. This threshold measured in lines of code was one million lines. It was believed in the late 70s, early 80s that computer programs going beyond one million lines of code could break down and would break down. The US military actually designed a new programming language called ADA from ADA Lavalais, the sponsor of Charles Babbage and collaborator in uh, their endeavors uh, in the 19th uh, century in uh, their attempt to build mechanical computer, computing devices, uh, the analytical engine and uh, others, some of which would work and others that would go beyond what was possible at the time. The other language was designed in order to make programs as reliable as possible while allowing them to grow in size. Ada was excessively cumbersome and the various requirements and constraints that it put on programmers and designers of computer programs made it so that it couldn't be adopted by a wide number of developers. But it is the case that our programming tools evolved to the point where a million lines of code is still a lot for an individual developer to write, but actually we have now code bases of tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of lines of code. And they work. They may not be defect-free, but they are reliable. How reliable? Well, your individual computer sometimes will blow up and reboot itself because it encountered a mistake as deep as it couldn't just keep going. And... Um, it crosses its fingers and says, listen, I will try to restart completely. Let's hope that I will not meet the conditions that made me blow up again. But when it happens to Google or Facebook or Twitter or to, to the other systems that we came in the past 10 years or 20 years relying on to do our daily computing tasks, it is worthy of prime time news. That is how reliable they have become with millions of users simultaneously and billions of users in total over the course of, let's say, a month, knowing that these systems will be there when they are needed. New paradigms are always tested in order to understand if they can help programmers to be more productive and produce more reliable code. One of these paradigms, always around the corner, is virtual reality. You may not think of virtual reality as a platform for programmer productivity. But as a matter of fact, Jaron Lanier, 
who coined the term virtual reality and who created uh, in the 80s the data glove for manipulating um, computer data in uh, 3D space and the corresponding visor what is today Oculus or the HTC Vive uh, series of uh, immersive visualization systems in a precursor 40 years earlier named his company VPL Research and not a lot of people remember that VPL in the name of the company stood for Visual Programming Languages because Lanier believed that virtual reality would be applied to improving programmer productivity. Programmers would be able to manipulate vast amounts of data visually, navigating 3D spaces with the same ease with which we may walk around plucking apples from a tree in a beautiful garden. So that didn't happen, or at least did not happen yet. But certainly the various programming editors, the various integrated development environments, debuggers and tracers and deployment architectures have evolved greatly. To the point where an individual programmer today can handle tasks that needed tens of specialized programmers previously. Today, following the official publication in Nature magazine of Google's recent results with their quantum computers, the New York Times published an article about quantum supremacy and what it means, what are the implications for classical computers and how the new generation of quantum computers may change what we believe can be done with computers. I dedicated an episode of the context previously to quantum computing and I invite you to go and watch it. And in terms of the topic of today, our languages for programming, it is a beautiful challenge to understand what are going to be the tool sets that the developers working with quantum computers will need to use in order to make them productive. Yes, the algorithms themselves will have to be completely rewritten and the algorithms don't depend on the particular com programming language uh, whether you need to sort a certain set of results by a certain parameter or whether you need to um, handle data differently uh, in order to then manipulate it and achieve what you want, the way that quantum computers are going to allow programmers to do that efficiently is going to be very different. But what I'm referring to is at the higher layers of abstraction. The same way that we were able to make individual programmers productive because we gave them a tool set that broke down perceived barriers on how classic computers could be used by teams or individuals, we are now in need of developing new interfaces, new tool sets to deal with quantum computers. And part of the beauty of this challenge is that quantum computers are not intuitive. A lot of people blame themselves because they 
don't have an intuitive grasp of the quantum logic of superposition and entanglement and other concepts that are mathematically precise, but they are counter to common sense perceptions of the world. They don't have to blame themselves. Specialists, scientists, physicists, mathematicians, logicians, who day in, day out for their entire professional career work in the field, do not develop an intuitive understanding of the field. It is just too far and too alien from our understanding and perception. So is it going to be the case that with these productivity tools, we will equip the programmers with the opportunity to develop intuitive understanding of quantum phenomena that wasn't possible before? I am not sure. I wish that were the case. I would really want us to be able cognitively to go beyond the limitations of how we see the world and to understand how uh, the principle of indeterminacy of Heisenberg, for example, applies to systems that we want to analyze and optimize and work on with our quantum computers. It may or may not happen. I am, on the other hand, pretty sure that as artificial intelligence is going to be part of the equation, we will be able to build systems that communicate with us and they form a kind of an oracle where we can ask questions and better than an oracle we can go behind the scenes and verify that the answers are actually correct and the reasons for those answers but that these AI quantum oracles are going to have an intuitive understanding of the quantum world because the way that they will be designed will mean that that is where they live. That is where their day-to-day -day experiences come from. So it is going to be a fascinating journey. And I am sure that as we are digitizing our economy, our production systems, we are digitizing our space exploration projects, everything we do because it would be crazy to do otherwise not to go digital about some endeavor these new tools are going to keep evolving and make us ever more able to address our challenges i hope that you want to come together with me in seeing how these are going to unfold and i welcome you to support the context on Patreon to help me and my team produce these episodes for you in the coming future.